in this uh, session uh, that will focus on protecting biodiversity and nature through a circular economy. Since all our speakers are ready and we have here real experts on uh, how to make uh, progress in the protecting biodiversity through a circular economy, I will just give them the floor and I'm going to remind you all that we, we are receiving and we are ready to uh, collect questions in the chat of, of, uh, of the session. So please don't hesitate to, to send your question there. Um, without further ado, Mr. Putosnik, thank you very much. Can you please upload my presentation? It should be in, in, in the screen now. Yeah, okay, thank you. It is a great pleasure to address you all on this very important topic. So how we can protect biodiversity and nature through the circular economy. The first thing which I would like to mention is that for the first time in the human history, we actually face the emergence of a single tightly coupled human socio-ecological system of planetary scope. So we are more interconnected and interrelated, interdependent than ever. And if we don't understand that in this COVID crisis, then we are really blind. Our individual and collective responsibility has thus enormously increased. If we compare humans and biodiversity, what is the actual difference? We have the voice. We can say the things loud and clear. We can rule, we can govern, we can decide. We have invented democracies, we can go on elections, and if we don't agree on the elections, we can even raise our voice on the streets and protest. Biodiversity has no voice and depends to a large extent on the existing level of human understanding and responsibility. When it disagrees with the behavior, it can not raise the voice. It protests in a way that it's dying out or disappearing from the planet. And yes, we are hearing this silent voice of biodiversity in the recent decades very loud and very clearly, but uh, it looks like we are still not hearing it very clear. If we look it through the planetary boundaries, we can easily identify that biodiversity story, biodiversity planetary boundary has already been crossed. According to Living Planet Index, 60% of living species has disappeared in the last 40 years. And according to one of the recent reports from IPBS, biomass of the mammals living in the nature has been reduced in recent decades for 82%. So why European Green Deal is so important in that context? Because it's a new growth strategy, which is for the first time really clearly saying that economic development and preservation of nature are not in contradiction. Actually, that future economic well-being depends on that, how we will treat natural resources and also how we will protect nature. So in integral part of the European uh, uh, Commission strategy to implement United Nations 2030 agenda and the SDGs, and it's important that we understand it in a way that this is not only December's communication, but it's actually all the documents which were following. And Farm to Fork and Biodiversity Strategy, which are in particularly extremely important in this context, are also for me or should be considered as part of the European Green Deal. But let me now turn to something which is coming from the work which we are doing uh, in the International Resource Panel, which I'm co-chairing. According to uh, our uh, Global Resource Outlook, which was released last year, environmental impacts in the value chain of resource extraction and processing phase actually are causing 90% of global biodiversity loss, land-related and water stress, 50% of the global climate change impacts and one third of the air pollution health impacts. If we look a bit more to the story of the biodiversity, it is pretty much connected to the biomass. So biomass is responsible for over 80% of water stress and land use related biodiversity loss. And if I- I'm participating in a meeting here. Language to a more human language. I need to 
it's important. It's, I don't know if I am in. Uh, can you please uh, mute yourself? If we translate that to a more human language, one can say that we cannot solve the land-related biodiversity problems without addressing the things which are related to how we manage biomass, which is to a large extent connected to agriculture and forestry, in particular to the agriculture question. So a very nice message came across to me just uh, during the weekend when I was watching Kiss the Ground, uh, one of the Netflix documentaries, uh, which if I summarize this, was simply like that. Healthy soil leads to healthy plants, healthy plants to healthy animals and healthy humans, and all that to healthy waters and healthy climate. If we eat healthy food, the earth is also healthy, and we are healthier too. Poor land leads to poor people, and poor people to social breakdown. Simple and clear, and very clearly explaining also the connection with the scientific results from the IRP, which I have showed before. So in many, in many cases, we are just focusing on the end of the story, on the, infl on the results, on the state and impact. So when we talk about biodiversity loss, when we talk about climate change, we actually talk about the, the results. But what is truly important is that we look to the drivers and pressures which are causing those results. And that's why the resource management is so important because when we look at it from the economic side, uh, they are to a large extent determining uh, the competitiveness of the companies. But when we look at it from the side of the state and impacts, they are to a large extent also determining the state and impact of biodiversity loss and climate change. And that's why it's important that we really address drivers and pressures. And if we look to some of core messages which came from our work, we have to treat the disease, not the symptoms of biodiversity loss. Apply resource use management approaches, then consider consumption and productive di production drivers. Focus on choices individuals, governments make about how we produce and consume the things that come from our natural environment, virtually everything. And do not forget that if we address common drivers of impacts of biodiversity, we actually address also other co-benefits co which are related to SDGs, like climate change impacts, water preservation, and other goals for better productivity, and I could continue. So some specific advice which came from our current or past work, better to say, were better transparency and of impacts through the value chain and across borders with natural resource footprinting accounting it's important you can find more of that oh, it's asking me to create a pool in our g20 natural resource use report no but the 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 the, the screen just asked me to create a pool no okay land and ocean planning integrated plans for the optimal use of land and ocean would enable national and local governments to identify pressure points where the impact of resource consumption, production and processing needs to be reduced. And you can find more in the report land restoration for achieving the SDGs. And finally, regenerative bioeconomy production. Biomass extraction in the form of forestry, fishing and agriculture has a significant role to play as a primary driver of natural resource use and therefore biodiversity loss. Natural resource management approaches, which emphasize regenerative practices, can help mitigate these impacts. And you can find more about that in our food systems at natural resources, as well as a follow growing report. So decoupling of our future well-being and economic growth from the use of natural resources is essential. And all that, of course, from environmental impacts. It's pure physics. If we don't do that, we will hit the walls and we are already hitting them. Green Deal, it's actually based on the circular economy and circular economy should be understood as an instrument for delivering this decoupling of economic growth from resource use and economic impacts I was talking before about. And tomorrow, the Club of Rome and Systemic will release a new report which talks about the system change compass how actually to implement the European Green Deal in time of recovery. We do claim that ambition of the European Green Deal and the vision is absolutely high, and we have to appreciate that. So setting 
zero net emissions for GAG 2050, decoupling of growth and resource use, acknowledging that just transition is extremely important, that we, that it aims at strongly interlinked and mutually reinforcing policy recommendations. But implementation, we do believe it's quite uncertain. Why? Because it does not sufficiently address the drivers and pressures, because it does not offer a real systemic perspective to guide decision making, and of course also because of the COVID-19 recovery, which will not make the things easy. So what we are proposing? We are actually proposing a compass, 10 core principles. I will explain that on the next slide. Then for each of the 10 principles in the compass, we are proposing three, uh, three policy recommendations, so 13 total. This is leading us to economic ecosystems and a reality check with the life. And finally, to 50 plus development opportunities which we see which would be in line with these economic ecosystems and also with the compass direction. It will be a bit clearer from this picture. So we call for redefining prosperity, for redefining natural resource use, for redefining progress, redefining metrics, redefining competitiveness, redefining incentives, redefining consumption, redefining finance, redefining governance, and finally redefining leadership in circle because none of that is first and none of that is last because you have to simultaneously work on them. And when you connect it to more real economy, then we have identified four, uh, or sorry, eight economic ecosystems. Why we are naming it economic ecosystems? Because ecosystems are as much connected between themselves as natural ecosystems. And because a lot of economic solutions can be actually learned from how the nature is solving those problems. We have identified four which are directly linked to the resource use, which are of course nutrition, housing, mobility, and then consumer goods, like uh, computers which we are using, clothes we are wearing, and so on. And this is predominantly causing then the, the consequences which are linked to biodiversity and other state and impact, because it goes through the resource use while the others are, of course, also extremely important, but they are supporting this resource use. And uh, these are uh, nature-based solutions, energy which we are using, materials which we are using, of course, in a circular way. And of course, then you have digitalization, innovation coming from, uh, from uh, business sector and also from others. So all of that, it's pretty simple structure which is very much going through the optic of resources and very much going through the optic of uh, natural resource use. And then we have identified 50 plus basic, most uh, useful uh, or promising would be better to say economic developments in various of those economic ecosystems. And one, when I have compared them to European partnerships, I have actually found out that it's quite a lot of coverage uh, so uh, that they cover each other. Only the European partnerships are better addressing health because uh, we have not addressed it in particular. And these are much better addressing also not only supply, but also the demand side, which I think should absolutely be taken into account. To conclude, I think it's important. Uh, I was uh, present, as you might know, on the, on the Nagoya 2010 CBD COP which was at that time quite revolutionary because it was after the failure of Copenhagen and it was a new renewed uh, energy for multilateralism. We have adopted Aichi targets. We have adopted Nagoya protocol. Later in Hyderabad 2012, we have adopted also the financial agreement. But targets and commitments, uh, my dear friends, are easy part. We cannot assume that because sustainability is on the map, a return to nature will happen. We should rather make sure that other commissioners, ministers, DGs, companies, and so on, will know how to read this map. And what is most needed is effective integration into policies that define the way we work, the way we travel, the way we consume. For example, clear conditionality in investment, funding, procurement, economic incentives, taxation, and so on. There has never been a better moment for Europe to move from the history of this resource-driven imperialism 
into an era of responsible use of natural resources, mitigating its resource fragility and strengthening preparedness and resilience. This would also clearly position European Green Deal and give it a real historic and also strategic weight. As Johann Wolfgang Goethe said, knowing it's not enough, we must apply. Willing it's not enough, we must do. I think we are currently still in the face of knowing and willing, but it's high time that we move into application and doing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Potosnik. I wanted to thank you for being able to keep track of your key messages while uh, having some interruptions. I, I would like to ask uh, all the speakers to mute uh, their microphones where they are not uh, taking the floor, please. And um, if you allow me, uh, Mr. Potosnik, I will uh, keep this message in mind. Uh, it's time from moving or to know when to apply and I'm for willing to do. And let's try to, to find out uh, from our panelists what is happening and what, what are the good practices that are uh, taking us from applying to, to doing. Um, the panel that we will have today will be composed from different uh, panelists that will try to share with you the good practices along the, uh, the value chain. Um, and we will have first uh, Mr. Mansour, the Mansour Direct, Director Office of the Climate Change, Biodiversity and, Envi and Environment from the Food and Agriculture Organization. Pierre Victoria, Head of Sustainable Development in Veolia. Anetele Ione, uh, Mighty Campaign and Legal Director, Mighty Earth. Uh, um, after hearing their, their, their abuse, their good practices and, and their stories, we will move to the Commission the representative, uh, Paola Migliorini, the head of unit of uh, the unit dealing with implementation of the Circular Economy Action Plan in the environment. So uh, please, Mr. Mansu, if you are ready. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Ladies and gentlemen, great pleasure to be with, with you here today in this uh, special session of the, the Green Week, the European Green Week, on protecting biodiversity and nature, because uh, this needs to be done while we ensure food security and nutrition and improving livelihoods. And uh, maintaining this equilibrium is possible, but it's also challenging. The number of uh, undernourished people in the world has increased, and we have more than 820 million people which is one in every nine people in the world suffering from hunger. Uh, and in 2019, um, about 3 billion people cannot afford a healthy diet. And when we talk about a healthy diet, it's not only uh, the effect of uh, hunger, but also the malnutrition that leads to the other extreme problem, which is obesity. So uh, we, it's, 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 uh, an endemic problem uh, that we, we have to address through uh, better management of natural resource biodiversity and enhancing food security and nutrition. Food loss and waste remain a key issue that I think we should bring to the attention of all of us. When we talk about food loss, is the one that is lost between uh, the, the, the producing and the post-harvesting up to the, 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 the retail level, we estimate that about 14% globally goes wasted. And then when it go, goes lost in this process, and the waste that occur after the consumer uh, acquire the food can be even much bigger. Uh, the the, the COVID-19 pandemic that we are going through is uh, increasing the challenge uh, for food security in many countries. and. Uh, it is expected to, unfortunately, amplify the number of people living in poverty, pushing probably 150 million more people into extreme, extreme poverty next year. As we know from various assessments, including our own FAO State of the World Biodiverse for Food and Agriculture and the Global Assessment of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Service of the IPBES, Biodiversity and ecosystem services uh, that we depend from are significantly threatened. And the IPBS estimates that a million species, up to a million species, are on the risk of extinction. The most comprehensive recent assessment to date 
on the state of nature in the European Union also paints a, a gloomy picture. Only 15% of habitats and about a quarter of species assessed are in good conservation status. If we look at the European reports we have been uh, reading lately. Although the drivers of habitat degradation and species decline are diverse, agriculture res is responsible for, for major land use chains and for also for greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, urbanization may become second largest driver of ex ecosystem degradation and biodiversity loss. So we have a big role to play to revert and to make sustainable agriculture a, a response, a friend of biodiversity conservation. So transformative actions are necessary to drive this global transition towards sustainability. Inclusive and uh, equitable food systems can help a lot. And uh, we have to tackle the root causes of environmental degradation that will also help us tackle the root causes of hunger and poverty. Bioeconomy is an important building block that we want to, to, to promote to, towards more sustainable food systems. As you know, we have next year the, the Global Food uh, uh, System Summit that is called by the United Nations. It's a great opportunity for countries to revisit this, uh, their strategies towards sustainability. Almost 50 countries in the world are already using bioeconomy as part of the economy based in biology and, and, and the biosciences. And this has been very, uh, proving very uh, promising for sustainable and circular uh, and circularity to be implemented. So we sustainable circular bioeconomy rests on a principle of circularity to transform the current energy and resource intensive economies and those that can be more resource efficient. Uh, we are very much engaged with, especially with the European models that we have been following to promote this worldwide. Integrating the environmental, social, economic dimensions of the, the sustainability, of course. So making the transition requires transformation and this transformation has to achieve our food production and our food systems. Um, the sustainable and circular bioeconomy in food and agriculture can seriously play an important role to promote growth while preserving nature, restoring ecosystems and harnessing the research and innovation opportunities that biodiversity, sustainable management of biodiversity, conservation of biodiversity can provide. Uh, in Europe, Europe is a good model because uh, the agro-food industry is prominent in bioeconomy, employing a lot of people uh, and generated significant value added to the products. Uh, there are national studies pointing to the positive employment effect when a circular economy is implemented. But let's look also at nature-based solutions. It's widely recognized that practices used in a sustainable and circular manner, harnessing the potential of bioeconomy, can lead to increased resource use, putting less pressure on nature, for instance, reducing food loss and waste, uh, which is uh, also de decreasing the need for agriculture expansion and putting less pressure on ecosystem. In certain cases, in certain regions like Sub-Saharan Africa, we need the, our last estimate was about 35% of food being lost or waste. You can imagine what it represents in terms of loss of resource involved. And we are talking about a continent where in certain parts of it, due to different causes, mostly related to social unrest and climate change, hunger is growing. So it's, it's indecent actually to, to have to face in the same continent or in the same planet issues of hunger and, uh, and uh, poverty, uh, especially on hunger and malnutrition, when we have food produced that could feed the whole population of the world today, and of course, the population to come. There are, there are several biodiversity-friendly uh, approaches to build on biological knowledge and science, uh, like uh, integrated pest management or using of local varieties and breeds, of crops and animals to improve productivity, adaptability, and resource efficiency. And we are very much committed to this. Moving to innovation. Um, this, is, this is key because the transformation has to come through innovation. This has been proved in many studies. And uh, uh, for instance, microbe research 
and applications can improve the productivity of sustainability on farmers uh, to use of eco-compatible solutions such as micro, microbial-based fertilizers, plant growth promoting bacteria and plant bioconditions and biocontrol products. Um, we are, with the CBD, working very hard to understand better soil biodiversity. This is another area that has been prominent and we hope that at the next conference of the parties we will be able to, to enlarge the knowledge uh, by bringing an ass global assessment of soil biodiversity that we are going to launch soon uh, with the collaboration of the CBD Secretary. Uh, in terms of um, uh, also in terms of nutrition, alternative proteins from food and feed, such as uh, the different sources that are used throughout the world, um, uh, can can make a difference on bio industries and, and, and the sustainable circular economy. Um, on concrete examples, we are implementing a project that's named the World Sustainable Bioeconomy, uh, which is funded by the German Ministry of for Food and Agriculture. And we support specific countries in developing sustainable and circular bioeconomy strategies. That includes uh, at least two very prominent examples that we are working with Uruguay and Namibia. Um, but before that, in 2016, we contributed to the establishment of the International Sustainable Bioeconomy Working Group, supporting knowledge exchange uh, and uh, sustainability uh, of bioeconomy discussions. The group has now 35 members, uh, 10 of them are European members, including national ministries, universities, and the Commission itself is a member. There is an EU bio-based industry consortium joint undertaking, which is a private-public partnership worth 40 billion euros is part of it. And uh, we hope that more will come, will join us in, the, in this bioeconomy working group, the ISBWG. So international collaboration uh, between governments, public, private researchers are essential for optimizing the resources and sharing the knowledge that we have on sustainable and circular bioeconomy can play an uh, uh, enormous role for food systems transformation, for positive transformation. This is especially important in order to harness the research and innovation opportunities that biodiversity provides. The new uh, European Union biodiversity strategy that's been discussed brings us another opportunity for this. Let us, uh, we also have in FAO the mainstreaming biodiversity strategy, which plan of action has been discussed recently in our technical committees. Uh, this is, this has to move from the global movement into a global action. So let's continue innovative, nature positive solutions to be implemented to lead to positive transformations and change the agro food systems in the way that we need to make sure that a sustainable circular bioeconomy will be in place sooner rather than later. My last point is related to the pandemic. There is a growing interest for a green recovery of the current crisis that the planet is going through. This can be turned into an opportunity for us to find these nature positive solutions and bring them uh, as, a, as, a, as an opportunity for generating jobs for generating a healthy environment and more ecosystem services for, for all of us. I stop here and I'm happy to, to respond to any questions that may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mansur. Really, really interesting also your call for having us a more sustainable and circular bioeconomy as a way to con to increase the contribution of, of circularity to, to halt biodiversity loss. I want to take this minute to really encourage participants to, to share questions with us so we can address them in the, after the intervention of Paola. And if possible, to have a, a kind of a discussion with, with panelists. I, I hope that you are following us uh, at home behind the computers. Um, let's move on now with our next uh, speaker who is going to present as well what is Veolia doing in, in the field of uh, circular economy with a view to protect biodiversity loss and how acting at the end of life uh, of products can also contribute. Uh, Mr. Bio Victoria, if you are ready. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, maybe do you have my presentation? 
it's it's in on the screen right now and we will be passing the slides okay thank you very much and and how, how to change the slide oh, is good okay okay you can see it okay okay so um, as you know or you don't know but veolia is uh, offers environmental solution to its clients in fact, we have half of clients are uh, public bodies and half of them are industrial. We work about in uh, about uh, 50, 55 countries all over the world, whatever is the level of development of, the, of these countries. But how uh, our uh, mission now is not only to provide water, uh, to manage wastewater, waste, wastewater treatment and energy services. But really, our objective is to create local loops to uh, connect services which were previously disconnected and to do that at the local level, because our job is really to work with the local resources for local clients. For us, uh, the circular economy is at the heart of our strategy. Our ambition is resourcing the world, as you know. And for that, we consider that we must work uh, in uh, sobriety. That means to, to consume less, to have more efficiency and circular economy. For us, sobriety, efficiency and circular economy are really the real response to deal with the main challenge we have to deal with such as climate change, biodiversity, and, uh, and the question of resources. About the question of biodiversity, we have a, a specific uh, job to do because um, uh, our activities interfere with the natural environment. Of course, if we do our job well, such as uh, manage waste, wastewater treatment plants uh, to we of course we will preserve the good quality of rivers and oceans if we uh, do recycling works or limiting emissions in the air of course it is there is a consequences for 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 the nature what is interesting it is that when five years ago we decided to have specific commitments for biodiversity climate change and circular economy we have a big big uh, support from the local levels for biodiversity it's uh, as you know uh, in fact climate change is really most a problem of uh, uh, our staff at the headquarters in something difficult sometimes to explain to the operationals how to fight against climate change and biodiversity is more take account by the local level and by the operators uh, veolia has uh, in uh, sorry i tried to change my slide uh, yes uh, veolia was the first company in france to give itself a purpose and in this purpose we have specific ambition. This purpose is not only on, on, about the question of environmental issues. It is all the, the performance of Veolia that is included in this, in this performance. We have a purpose and we have a, a, a dashboard for a, a dashboard for all the companies, including environmental, social, economic uh, issues. For the environmental part of, of this dashboard, we have really four priorities. Combating climate change, promoting circular economy, protecting environment and biodiversity, and preserving water resources. For that reason, um, of course, uh, this ambition is uh, um, completely in uh, accordance with the decisions of European uh, Union and through the water directive and about the question of new circular economy action plan. In the new, during the debate about new circular economy action plan, we were very supporting the idea that the, 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 the reuse of water is really a very big uh, response to the question 
not only of stress, hydric stress, and to create new resources if we can using it for agriculture and industrial purpose. As you know, it was very, we were in France in a very specific situation because you can buy tomatoes from Israel or from Morocco where, where the irrigation was made by reuse water. It's not, not, not possible to do, to buy and to do that for France or for different country in Europe. Now, due, thanks to the, the, the European decisions, we can do that. I think it's very important for us. Maybe this purpose means our, our clients, of course, have a lot of expectation about our environment solutions for climate, for biodiversity and circular economy. The first one, because we, the previous speaker was from Food and Agriculture Organization, is a specific partnership we have now with uh, Yara. Yara is a group specializing in crop nutrition. And we have an agreement to develop the circular economy in Europe's food and agriculture production chains by recycling nutrients from wastewater sludge in closed loops. What do we, what is the, the what is, is um, this partnership focus on three, on three areas? Firstly, developing new circular agriculture models by recycling nutrients from urban agriculture and industrial waste into high quality fertilizer. Secondly, to create a food to agriculture value chain, collecting food surplus in cities to turn them into organic fertilizer and by providing soil improvement solutions for peri-urban agriculture. So part of this agreement is developing new business opportunities based on this real symbiosis. For that, Veolia and Yara have already set up a, a circular economy loop by recycling ammonia produced from composting green waste and wastewater sludge into sodium nitrate. With Yara, we have relaunched the, a new alliance, the Nutrient Upcycling Alliance, to promote these ideas that from the sludge, we can, new, we can uh, turn into new resources for agriculture. Second example, and we go now in China, is Sinopec. Sinopec is a very big petrochemical plant. It's very near from Beijing. It's 40 kilometers far from, from Beijing. And is a specific uh, uh, challenge for us because we have to operate and maintain wastewater treatment plants and process water fed facilities, such as specific water for the process, industrial process of this industrial group, but in a very specific place because it's a, a, a high water, you have in this part of China, you have high water stress, you have a very sensitive natural environment, and of course, you have to a risk of flooding. Of flooding. That means that we're very sensitive. We have a problem of quality of water. We have the problem of quality of environment and we have the risk, specific risk due to, to the floods. So for that, we have, we have really made a specific innovation response by optimizing water consumption, increasing the water recyc recyc recycling rate to reduce the site's water footprint. What we did concretely. In fact, the, the after treatment, the wastewater are reintroduced into the wetlands. This vast area is home to wealth and landscape and ecosystem. To restore biodiversity, Veolia has created 23 terraces near the Sinopec complex. Each of these terraces has specific vegetation carefully chosen for its purification qualities in order to optimize the quality of the water entering the natural environment. So in this area, we have really a lot of birds, very 50 birds species are populate in this area. And as a result, 60% of which water is used 
and there is a net improvement in this charge into this aquatic environment. It is very, for us, a very big reference because it was very complicated action. And as said before the previous speaker, that means that with innovation, we can deal with different uh, challenges, including the question of the biodiversity. My third example is a, it's about the question of plastic. Of course, everybody, it's a, this, this issue is, is well known and everybody knows that now that we have a big problem in the oceans because 8 million tons end up in the oceans every year and with that, and, and only 10% of the world plastic waste is recycled, recycled. So Veolia really believes that one of these solutions is to ta tackle these problems with, by a better collecting and recycling plastics. And it's really not only expectation for different society, it's a firm expectation for our clients. In fact, the clients ask us and demand us to give us their solutions to deal with the question of the, the plastic because it is a question of reputation for a lot of, of them. For that, we believe that to stop the, the, this, this pollution, we must work upstream on land-based pollution, which is the sole source of 80% of marine pollution. So if we can treat this pollution as a land sea interface, and of course, we can promote, uh, we have three, three concrete actions, is treating pollution on the coast and upstreams, of course. Secondly, is anticipating and reducing regions vulnerability. A, a, a problem we have, of course, it is the floods, uh, and in some some cities like uh, Copenhagen, we have we have um, uh, offer new solution to prevent wastewater from being discharged into the sea if flooding occurs. And thirdly, we work in the question of uh, making production methods and consumption patterns secular. We are supporting the development of plastic recycling in order to aid the transition and emit the vol volume of plastic water. We are now a leader to, to deal with the question of plastic and how um, uh, we are convinced that this challenge can be solved very easy if all stakeholders will really want to, to, to give the, the, the good solutions. Yeah, just to conclude, firstly, uh, it's when we were in 2015 in the COP21, Antoine Fréau called me, uh, uh, what, what is the, the main message of Veolia for the, during the debate about the, the Paris Agreement on Climate? And I, t and I told him uh, the best uh, uh, stake for us is to explain that to be uh, operator of circular economy means to be actor against the climate change. I think that it's, it told me it, 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 well, it is very difficult, you know, Pierre, to, to, to explain that. What is sure is now these stakes and these issues are really uh, well known and we have, we, and it's very uh, more easier, it's easier to develop and to scale up it because really uh, the link between uh, climate change and circular economy is really uh, is really uh, relevant for a lot of people. I think for the biodiversity it's the same thing. It's not so complicated to explain the link between circular economy and uh, biodiversity. We have some example I showed you, but of course for for us we are completely involved in the idea that the future and the the big challenge for the 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 future is really to deal, to change, to shift our model of consumption and to come from the linear model to the secular economy. Thank you very much. I, I really need to, to, to interrupt you because we would like to hear the next speaker, but I, I completely agree on your point of let's try to, to develop the knowledge to, to for the circular economy to contribute to biodiversity loss. Thank you very much for, for your time and, and your contribution to the discussion, uh, Etel. Uh, uh, I will give you directly the floor and thank you very much for, for, 
for being brief uh, as much as you can. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. I'm Etel Igonet from the environmental organization Mighty Earth. If we could go to the next slide. Um, today, I, I think I'll be echoing some of the messages that um, the other speakers before have mentioned, Mr. Potosnik and Mansour, but perhaps uh, I'll be a little bit more provocative and also maybe a little bit more tangible and concrete, or as we say in French, terre à terre. So often when people talk about circular economy, what they think about is manufacturing how we can transform manufacturing and have cradle to grave with cars and things like that. But in reality, as um, uh, Mr. Mansour was alluding to, uh, one third of climate change is due to agriculture. Three quarters of deforestation is due to agriculture. Agriculture and food are the major driver of biodiversity loss as we hurdle into the Anthropocene towards irreversible cataclysmic climate change. So if we don't figure out how to reinvent agriculture and apply circular economy thinking, we will not be able to curb biodiversity loss and climate change. This must be done in agriculture. And I will say that um, unfortunately, the EU is a core part of the problem as well as being a core part of the solution. And, um, you know, as we were discussing, uh, this climate change, deforestation, biodiversity loss, air pollution, water contamination, antibiotics resistance, the ways in which agriculture feeds into obesity and hunger. These are things that the EU in many ways can transform, not only for the European Union, but also for the geographies where we've essentially outsourced our agricultural problems because we're importing deforestation from those countries. Um, I just think it's, it's valuable to note that for every dollar we spend on food, society pays $2 in health and environmental and economic costs, and that one third of food is lost and wasted annually. If food waste were a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter behind China and the US. So all that to say, we must absolutely break out of this linear, extractive, take, make, waste model of pesticide soaked monoculture agriculture. And we have to reinvent agriculture to become regenerative. That's something that Mr. Potoshnik really talked about. And I think it's vital that we focus on how we must all transform agriculture to be regenerative, both in the EU with the cap, but also coming into the EU via supply chains with the new proposed law on imported deforestation. And then of course, rethink food waste and rethink the bioeconomy. So let's go to the next slide. Having said all these somewhat harsh things, let me add that we are already in the midst of imagining a bioeconomy. We already know much of what we need to know in order to solve the problems. Of course, additional innovation is always valuable, but I take issue with the idea that innovation is a sine qua non because we've already innovated enough to have many of the solutions for transforming agriculture at our fingertips. There's fantastic examples. Some of the most famous in the world of food and agriculture are the race of many supermarkets to solarize. That's um. On the upper left-hand corner, you can see a target supermarket from outer space, from a, a satellite map. Um, and those are our solar panels set up to look like a target, but Target and Walmart and Tesco and uh, supermarkets in Australia are now in this race to solarize, to create renewable energy right where the food uh, facility is located. We also see that there's tremendous lessons to be learned, not just in Europe, but from Asia, Japan is perhaps peerless when it comes to transforming food waste into scraps that feed some of the world's best and most prized and high quality and financially lucrative pigs. But we look at oat milk. Oat milk experienced 425% growth in one year. 
This is a great example of how we can roll out dairy alternatives. And that's vital because of course, cattle, beef, this is the top driver of deforestation in the world. Of the four titanic drivers, beef, soy, palm oil, pulp and paper, beef is, is really the most pernicious. The cattle industry is very problematic for climate change. But I'll even just cite small things like, you know, making beer from toast, um, just to quote Mr. Mensur, this is a classic example of upcycling. And Mr. Victoria as well talked about upcycling so that you create more and more and more lucrative businesses out of what used to be wasted. Let's just go to the next slide. Some more success stories before we dive into some of the tough final messages that I'll close out with. You know, um, the speaker from Veolia identified plastic uh, waste as being a problem. And many people don't know this, but each and every one of you that's watching this video probably has eaten a credit card worth of plastic every week. So this week, you're eating a visa. Last week, you ate American Express. The week before, a MasterCard. Plastic is making its way into our food system because as Mr. Pototnik said, if the earth is unhealthy, we are unhealthy. If our food systems are healthy, the earth is healthy. So um, actually the EU has financed bioplastic packaging that's made from leftover fruits and vegetables. But we also see companies that are making edible party cups, companies and cities and local governments that have rolled out fabulous composting. We see these new meatless burgers that are very promising, much like the oat milk that I referenced before. And just a little closing note of a cute example of how this is really a financial win for Europe struggling with pandemic job loss and business losses. You know, if you take something as simple as cherries, often ugly and disfigured cherries will just get wasted. That's very sad. But if you use them effectively, you can transform the kernels into cosmetics, you can transform the pulp into tea bags, and the juice into cherry juice. All of this means you're essentially monetizing four times over what would have been a pure loss. So I think it's important to touch base with some very tangible, positive examples that give us all a lot of hope and that explain really in a clear way that we can all grasp what does it mean to be in a circular food economy? And now let me go to the last slide. This is a little bit of a tougher message, I'm afraid to say. Um, the last slide is really about what the EU can do. As I started out by saying, the EU is at the core of the problem and the EU must also be at the core of the solution. The future is in the hands of the European Union in a, in a very important way, because not only does the EU produce locally, it consumes an enormous amount of food that's brought in from abroad, palm oil, um, beef, soy, cocoa, coffee, rubber, which is not food, but which is agriculture. All of these commodities are tied to extreme forms of deforestation and human rights violations, like slavery, indigenous land grabbing, child labor, bonded labor. So, it's vital actually that we green the cap and just start by cleaning things up at home in the European Union. Unfortunately, there was a pretty bad decision around the cap yesterday, I believe, but there's still hope and still potential to green the cap, the common agricultural policy. Then also the EU can flip subsidies. Right now, the EU is subsidizing some of the worst forms of agriculture. If I'm not mistaken, Monsanto got one of the biggest bailouts in the UK. Um, and we really shouldn't be giving bailouts from the pandemic uh, response financing to companies that are poisoning the planet and that are exactly part of the take waste uh, linear extractive old version of agriculture. We should be giving um, the sort of boost and financial incentive to innovative and uh, traditional companies that are really focused on a green circular economy. We're not going to have really, I think, the financial ability to run the race against the pandemic economic problems and run the race against climate change. We're really going to have to run that race twice with just one pot of money. So ensuring that the subsidies from the EU and that the pandemic um, uh, relief goes to green and circular economy businesses is vital. But then, of course, it's extremely important for the EU to support R&D, to design out waste and pollution, and to give incentives to European companies doing that. As we've seen, our value chains are so fragile. With the pandemic, we saw many 
hyper fragile supply chains collapsing or becoming so brittle that they're on the verge of collapse. So now we know we have to do better. We need to set up less long value chains with smart distribution. Agroecology is crucial. Transforming packaging, slashing waste, food waste and loss is one third of our food. And perhaps the most important is let's just focus on the place where we have the biggest impact. Let's look at the worst agri commodities and hone in there. There aren't so many of them. There's like six agri commodities that are really destroying the planet. That makes it a bit simpler to help um, address them. And the EU could go a long way just by reducing dependence on meat and dairy. So I'll stop there. I tried to be brief to make up for some of the other presentations having run over, but I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. It has been a very interesting presentation also on the role of retailers. I'm fully aware that I, we are a little bit behind the schedule, so I'm going to go directly to, to, the, to the Commission representative for her to really react on some of the points and also try to address some of the questions from the, from the audience. Um, Paula? Thank you very much, Maria, and thank you to all the speakers. Um, I wanted to thank in anticipation the participants who have posted questions. We will try um, to have some answers, maybe not directly to each of the questions, but with the reactions and then uh, some few last words that I will um, ask the speakers to, to give. So before I give my, my uh, wrap up and reaction, I would like the speakers to think for a moment of, um, and then I will, will ask you this would be the, the wrap up um, to say one word maximum two words that um, would be uh, what you identify as one priority action to reap the potential of the circular economy to protect biodiversity what would that be that one word that where we would need to focus so we are looking for for some solutions here so before I give uh, um, uh, respectively the floor to each of you to have this one two words i i would like to uh, uh, summarize uh, what we have heard lots of suggestions uh, starting from mr potoshnik i took notes we need to treat the disease we also from mr mansur we need to tackle the root that cause biodiversity degradation so um, somehow the two first uh, uh, presentations I saw some a lot of linkages in fact uh, the idea to tackle the root of biodiversity degradation that then will allow to tackle the the hunger crisis made me think of um, of uh, the quote you you indicated Mr. Potoshnik the one from Netflix on the the chain of health somehow huh? so this is really something that uh, I would like all the participants to to probably take home um, as a as a guiding uh, principles also in our own individual actions this is something that I think uh, the circular economy action plan has put forward a lot we need to empower consumers so we are all participants and hearing a webinar participants of green week but then after we become uh, consumers so let's take some of these uh, um, suggestions in uh, cl uh, clear uh, in mind and then very good also at the same time uh, some hopes we have heard some examples from mr victoria and madame igonet so these are um, only uh, only few uh, examples but uh, but very varied so i wanted really to thank you also uh, both speakers for for this so we can act on waste prevention we can act on water reuse we can act on different areas we can act with supermarkets we can act on products so there's really a variety and i think that the collective efforts will really bring us a little bit uh, forward in um, in this um, challenge that uh, that we have i want to take uh, also, the um, uh, suggestion or, or uh, message from uh, the last speaker that uh, we, as a European Union, we are part of the um, of the problem, but also part of the solutions. In fact, what did we do? We just uh, recently um, adopted a series of uh, of documents with uh, concrete measures: the eighth Environmental Action Program, the Chemical Strategy, and then earlier on in the year, the Farm to Fork, the Biodiversity Strategy, and Circular Economy Action Plan, which sets 
very specific actions to move towards and to make these uh, um, examples also a reality for others. I saw in the chats there were some questions on um, where can we find investments? Uh, where can we find resources for uh, for supporting uh, uh, entrepreneurs? So the European Union is putting uh, through the recovery package or through uh, the the usual research and innovation program or uh, life the environment program finance um, available for for this. I um, I see now that we might have only one few minutes, so I leave the floor to uh, in order as they have spoken uh, to the speakers to have these uh, wisdom words of uh, where do we need to start and what is the priority action to uh, bring uh, circularity and biodiversity for the benefit of the planets. Mr. Potoshnik? Great. We have two words for market signals. Mr. Um, I would like to take mostly the the question that came from from the Miss Gambetta on this, if I may. Um, Two words, because we are really running out of time. That's very quick one, because it's about the opportunity, right? Uh, she's asking what uh, the role of investors would uh, would uh, would have for for playing, contributing to protecting biodiversity and nature. It's the way that the investors, particularly private sector broadly, as she mentioned, would look at it in the, in the overall opportunities that come with circularity and uh, with nature as a whole. For instance, we have from 2021 to 2030, the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. When degraded ecosystems are taken as problems, they can also be taken as opportunity if restoring them will increase productivity and put more food into the market and generate jobs and generate ecosystem services. That so I take the word, Mr. Mansour, I'm sorry. I take the word of opportunity. It's turning, it's turning uh, the, the challenge into opportunities. Let's put it this way. Then. Excellent. Thank you. Miss, uh, Mr. Victoria? I think that to speed up uh, and scale up at the, at the same time, we need firstly to have uh, international standards because, I, of course, I make the comparison with the question of climate change. If we really, really make a lot of efforts in uh, to fight with climate change because we have now international standards. We don't have that for biodiversity. That is really a lack that uh, it's, if we have standards, we can benchmark we, and we can go, go ahead. Secondly, the second problem is we need to have incentive to uh, decision makers to adopt uh, biodiversity solutions. It's very difficult to, to act today to monetize uh, solutions from biodiversity. So, and the, I think the, the two points are linked. If we have standards, if we can start, I think we can uh, integrate a business model profitable in biodiversity. But for the moment, it's very difficult to uh, to promote this uh, this example, such as solutions nature based. Thank you very much to so international standards and incentives to decision makers as uh, saying we are part of the solution. And Madame Migonet? I have one word, which is agroecology. And I can just define it very quickly. It's essentially, it means regenerative agriculture as opposed to pesticide soaked monoculture. Perfect. Thank you very much. So as I said, uh, I think that we really tried, especially with the chemical strategy that just came out, to uh, bring some answers to uh, these challenges. And then we will see as all together with the stakeholders and then with the 150 more participants that we had today to this webinar to bring uh, the policies a little bit further. So I thank everyone 
with this and then um, I want to ensure that we will make available the slides I think through this portal and uh, uh, for any other bilateral follow-up I uh, invite uh, um, participants to connect with uh, uh, the uh, the organizers so thank you very much to all to all the speakers and uh, to all the participants thank you thank you so much